For many of us, the phrase follow the science was immediately seen as the thinly veiled political directive that it was. Surrender your critical thinking, surrender your independent thought, just shut up and do as you're told. Because even if the directive is scientifically correct, you don't sell your right to evaluate that science for yourself and to make decisions for yourself, especially for the cheap benefit of the perception of safety from some DC bureaucrat a thousand miles away who assuredly cares next to none about you or your family personally. Making matters worse, though, the science, as it was persistently advertised, was almost never correct. And so for the rest of us who bought into this fraudulent bargain, you have to wonder how many demonstrations of this fraud have to be made before we'll finally acknowledge and admit we were conned. Follow the science meant six feet of social distancing, for example. Many stores still have the scientifically designated place for you to stand in the checkout line. But that scientific designation was nothing of the sort, it turns out. That was actually just a political compromise between the CDC and Trump administration officials. Plus, the entire calculation was based on the assumption that droplets only were transmitting the virus. And it turns out this virus spreads through aerosolized particles as well, meaning either distance number in the original debate was irrelevant anyhow. And when we finally get to the cashier after jumping those scientifically designated lily pads on the floor, the science says it's best to have that engagement through a plexiglass barrier, except it doesn't. As of last summer, there wasn't a single scientific study that showed any benefit of these plastic dividers other than a big sales boost for the manufacturers. In fact, multiple studies say the barriers are harmful because they reduce airflow and ventilation, which allows the virus to remain suspended in the air for longer, thus increasing the risk of infection. And of course, any early belief we may have had in these nonsense rituals should have expired the moment they tried to sell us on the idea that Black Lives Matter protests presented no transmission risk, or perhaps more accurately, that BLM protests were confronting a more pressing public health issue of racism. And so a proper order of priorities meant allowing these protests to continue unimpeded. All the while, it was an improper order of priorities for you to think that maybe feeding your family or maybe your children's schooling or maybe your very livelihood itself might be important things to protect as well. Their politics were paramount. But you and your family? You were secondary collateral. It could not have been demonstrated any more clearly or explicitly. And that was two years ago. But many of us still haven't learned. And even if you're inclined to be generous and say, sure, a lot of those early judgments were wrong, but they were made with good intentions, that's still an acknowledgement that we were not, in fact, following the science. We were following speculation. We were following expectations, not demonstrations. We were following guesswork. Not real life data. Because remember, in the early days, it was stay home or else millions will die based on what? Based on models, based on predictions from supposedly important people, much, much smarter than you. But models are based on a series of inputs, a series of assumptions that can easily be flawed or just overly simplistic. Indeed, trying to capture all the world's variables in one calculation is necessarily so. And so we got all sorts of overly simplistic nonsense rules that don't play out scientifically because they don't stand up to basic logic. Does it make sense that we'll be safer from a highly contagious virus by shutting down restaurants and theaters if we all just congregate in greater concentrations at the grocery store instead? Does it make sense to shut down outdoor public spaces and force people inside to their homes when outdoor transmission is effectively non-existent and the most common place to get infected is in the home. Does it make sense to postpone routine medical checkups that can catch serious, potentially terminal conditions early in order to avoid the prospect of an infection with a 99% plus survival rate? We're just playing an adult game of the floor is lava, leaping through life in totally nonsensical ways, believing it's keeping us safe without any actual demonstration of it. And often, in total denial of the other guy walking right next to us, totally unharmed across the supposed lava floor. But at least now you can say that without being called anti-science, not that the true believers won't try, but some new science is out, and this science reviews what actually happened, not what was modeled or forecasted. And no, all these ridiculous restrictions we were told saved lives, 
They did not. In a meta-analysis published through Johns Hopkins University this week, three professors compiled data from 24 mostly peer-reviewed studies. Some were working papers, but all on the relationship between lockdowns, which these researchers define as compulsory non-pharmaceutical interventions, as in school closures, business shutdowns, travel restrictions, your general impositions of the last two years outside of vaccine mandates, and coronavirus mortality from the first wave of the infection. Most data prior to September 1st, 2020. Data considered include countries worldwide, but focus mostly on the United States and Europe. The studies included in this analysis have varied findings, some suggesting lockdowns had no statistically significant effect on mortality, others finding strong effects reducing mortality. But when all the factors are considered and all the data are crunched, these Johns Hopkins researchers find it all about evens out that lockdowns had no obvious benefit in reducing deaths, all data considered amounting to a reduction in deaths of 0.2%, effectively nothing, a result which easily could be attributed to simple statistical error, and even if accurate, was not the obvious benefit we bargained for in shutting down major pieces of our society to achieve. Indeed, the researchers say, based on these findings, lockdown policies are ill-founded and should be rejected as a pandemic policy instrument. Now, of course, all lockdown measures aren't the same thing. In terms of specifics, this analysis did find some evidence that bar closures may have reduced mortality, though that isn't widely studied or conclusive. And even if true, one would wonder if the science says close the bars specifically and save lives, why were we closing the coffee shop and the theater too? And of course, on the other side of this bargain, the cost of achieving this non-result was massive. This study doesn't look at the economic costs as one of its variables, but it does offer brief commentary on that cost, and there's no shortage of empirical demonstration of that cost elsewhere. Not just jobs lost in the millions and businesses closed in the hundreds of thousands in the United States alone, but significant spikes in drug overdose deaths, domestic violence incidents, lost learning time for children at school. The list goes on. It's like we spent our life savings on a Chihuahua guard dog, and the crooks showed up and kicked them aside and just robbed our house anyway. We paid everything, we got nothing. And the defenders of these policy decisions and the models on which they were based might say, yeah, well, better safe than sorry. We had to be cautious in those early days because we didn't know what was coming or how to stop it. Well, number one, not always better safe than sorry. You don't amputate your foot after stubbing your toe because if you do, you're not safe and very sorry. Number two, the reason you're sorry in that case is because you don't sell your first principles in the face of even the greatest threat anyway. But number three, we did know, actually. It turns out we had scientific reason to believe from the inception that these policies were garbage. That's one of the more subtle things I learned in this analysis. According to the WHO in 2006, reports from the 1918 influenza pandemic indicate that social distancing measures did not stop or appear to dramatically reduce transmission. Looking at Edmonton, Canada, Isolation and quarantine were instituted, public meetings were banned, all sorts of facilities were closed, business hours were restricted, all of it without obvious impact on the epidemic. And I checked that citation to make sure it's legit and not mischaracterized, and yeah, not only is that characterization accurate, there's more support for that conclusion. Again, according to the WHO, there were similar findings that lockdown measures for the 1918 flu did nothing or next to nothing in Togo and the United States as well. And if you thought the commitment to the pre-concluded narrative was strong in your typical neighborhood mask, Karen, it might be even stronger among the scientists, at least the approved ones. We're told that the science adjusts to the evidence, but not in this case, it doesn't. In this case, the science just gets buried in the sand right alongside their heads. Expert reaction to this analysis was immediately published in the Science Media Center, where science meets headlines, featuring Neil Ferguson, that guy who made the original models saying millions of us were dead if we didn't assume the fetal position and suck our thumbs indefinitely. He was a trusted authority until he was busted violating his own recommendations to see his mistress, and somehow he's retained his trusted authority status anyhow. But anyway, he says, well, this study is looking at deaths and that's the wrong measure. We should really be concerned with transmission rates. Well, one, you 
weren't concerned with transmission rates. In your March 2020 forecasts, you said proper lockdowns would minimize mortality, not transmission, by some of your modeling up to 98%, which of course did not happen. But two, why would we ever be concerned with transmission over mortality? The only reason we care about transmission is because mortality is a possible consequence. We have never cared about transmission rates for the cold, for example, because the mortality rates don't warrant it. Both Ferguson and another cited scientist at the Imperial College of London say this analysis is too broad in defining lockdown as the presence of any forced restrictive policy. That definition would make mask mandates a lockdown. That definition would mean the UK has been in permanent lockdown for years, they say. Sure, perhaps these measurements are imprecise, but if the impact of these variables is so obvious, it would show regardless. If your position is that all of these things work individually or in combination, then even imperfect measurement of these things should show results to some degree. It can't be that all of these things work, but if you consider them too broadly, then suddenly they stop working. Two plus two equals four, not five. But even five is closer to right than zero. These obvious effects should be cumulative not vanishing. Another quoted professor says, smoking causes cancer, the earth is round, and ordering people to stay home decreases disease transmission. None of this is controversial among scientists. A study purporting to prove the opposite is almost certain to be fundamentally flawed. Well, if that's a valid comparison, show me the peer-reviewed science that says smoking and cancer have no relationship. Show me the peer-reviewed science that says the earth is flat, because this analysis includes dozens of peer-reviewed studies that find little to no demonstration of what you say is so obviously true. And isn't that a perfect representation of what the science has now become? Instead of openly and honestly investigating the evidence, it's now just a sneer at you for even asking about the evidence at all. Science as a philosophy to question everything has morphed into a command to question nothing, just do and believe exactly as you're told. And so the lesson here is not just that the authorities were wrong on the science, though they were, it's that they were and are wrong on the basic morality of respecting and protecting people's rights. Because the former can flip and the latter will still create disaster regardless. The science can say conclusively that huddling in the corner, sucking your thumb, reduces your risk of a traffic death by 99%. It is replicated, it is peer reviewed, it is rock solid science ranking right there with the physics of gravity. It's indisputable, but that does not mean that somebody gets to forcibly lock you in your home or seize your car on account of it. And it does not mean that you should submit to anybody who says you get in that corner and you suck that thumb or else. Because the moral value of you making that risk assessment for yourself is of higher value than whatever the statistical measurement of that risk is. In simpler terms, there is little more wrong or dangerous than uncritically trusting someone who says, do as I say or else. Whether he's a mugger on the street or a nerd in a lab coat, neither has a right to force your submission and take your wallet. And if they actually cared about your wellness in any real way, as we're supposed to believe with the scientists, they'd respect your basic rights and not make such threats in the first place. That is the key lesson to learn here. Don't get lost in the stats or the variables or the charts, though of course those things do help inform the decisions that are ours to make. Instead, let's restore appropriate skepticism for anybody who says do as I say or else. Let's be daring enough to try or else. Thanks as always for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Gab that is at M L. Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chatting my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Goodbye.